Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. My name is Melissa Loriano, and I serve as the Programs Manager for the DC Preservation League. If you are new to DCPL, we are a citywide nonprofit organization founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic and built environment of Washington, DC through advocacy and education. I'd first like to take a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one today. They are Denton's, Douglas Development, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Buyer Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. Also, as part of our 50th anniversary celebration this year, September programs are specifically dedicated to exploring stories and sites found along DC's rivers. And this month is sponsored in honor of Peter H. Smith. So many thanks to you all for your dedication to historic preservation in Washington, DC. I also wanna share some notes about how our program is going to work today. So please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. I will collect your questions and verbally ask them of our speaker after his presentation. And for those of you joining us on Facebook, DCPL's Director of Development, Kelly Knox, will be monitoring any questions that you all might have and will pass those along to us as well. So with that, I'm so pleased to introduce you all to today's speaker. For the last nine years, Scott Kratz has been working with the Ward 8 nonprofit building bridges across the river and district agencies to transform an old freeway bridge into a park above the Anacostia River. He is working with the community to use the base of one of the old 11th Street bridges to create a one-of-a-kind civic space supporting active recreation, environmental education, and the arts. Kratz is a resident of Barracks Row, uh, Barracks Row and has lived in Washington, D.C. for the last 15 years. He has worked with, uh, in the education field for over 20 years and began his career teaching at Kidspace, a children's museum in Pasadena, California, and later as the Associate Director of the Institute for the Study of the American West at the Autry National Center in Los Angeles, California. While at Autry, uh, while at the Autry, he supervised a staff that planned and implemented programs including theater, film, music, festivals, family programs, lecture series, and academia, uh, academic symposia. Most recently, he was the Vice President for Education at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. He also serves on the board of the United Planning Organization and the Anacostia Coordinating Council. And with that, I am so pleased to uh, pass things along to Scott. Thank you, Melissa. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you to DC Preservation League for the invitation. Um, we were neighbors when I was at the Building Museum. Um, so, uh, and thank you to Melissa, who's been so incredibly helpful, and Rebecca for the um, invitation. Um, so, what we're going to do this afternoon is <clears throat> I'm going to share a little bit about the background of um, how the Bridge Park came to be and with the particular emphasis on how we've been engaging local residents to make sure they're shaping sort of every different programmatic element um, the, of the park. Um, it's my pleasure to share, you guys are gonna be some of the first to see some of our new renderings um, the, that um, we've been designing over the summer. Um, and then I'm gonna end the presentation um, talking about how this project has become, has become so much more than just a park. Um, how we're, we've been investing not only in the deep, in the infrastructure of the park itself, but in the communities and the neighborhood and in the residents um, the, of, um, of, of the adjacent neighborhoods. So um, with that, I'm going to share my screen so I can start my presentation. Um, there we go. All right. Um, so um, first of all, um, here we go. Um, I work for, um, as Melissa mentioned, I work for the East of the River nonprofit Building Bridges Across the River. Um, we are uh, an organization that's been around for about 20 years. Um, we run the ARC um, over on Mississippi Avenue. That's where my offices are. Um, we run the Skyline Workforce Center, also in Ward 8 on Good Hope and Naylor Road. Um, a, a uh, collection of eight, uh, seven um, the urban farms all in Southeast DC. Um, and then I've been leading the effort for the 11th Street Bridge Park, um, our largest capital campaign project to date. Um, this is a larger collaboration between um, building bridges across the river um, and the district government. Um, the, our partners at DDOT, the District Department of Transportation, 
um, have been wonderful because um, I've never built a bridge before, um, the, and they have. Um, and we've the project has, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as, as we go through. Um, has some uh, key or key designers um, or, or architects or OMA, um, landscape architect of Olin uh, and engineers at uh, WRA, and a host of both local and federal agencies that we've been um, working on from the beginning. But before I dive into the park itself, I want to actually step back and, and talk about a larger trend that's been happening um, the, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, and that's um, reusing old infrastructure and repurposing it um, the, into new civic spaces. Um, the, sorry, my phone was going off. Um, the probably best example of this um, is the High Line in New York. Um, the, um, this is the picture up to your left. Um, but there's now, we've been tracking over 170 of these transformed infrastructure into parks projects around the United States that include projects like Clyde Warren Park um, in Dallas, that's the image off to your right, where they've actually decked over an active freeway and re-stitched to, stitched together the arts district with um, the residential district. Um, the 606 in Chicago, um, the, where they took a several mile um, old and aged out elevated track similar to the High Line, um, the, and, um, transform that into, into an elevated uh, walking and biking um, path um, the, that's connecting otherwise disconnected neighborhoods. And, and in Detroit, um, the, they have the Dequindry Cut um, the, that's taken an old sunken um, railroad track um, the, and connected a series of residential neighborhoods to the Detroit River. Um, many of these projects um, they do connect um, the, and, and reconnect neighborhoods and, and also reconnect the city to uh, natural elements on um, the like rivers, like the Detroit River. And that's really um, germane to our conversation today because of course, one of the reasons why Washington DC was selected as our capital is we sit at the confluence of two rivers, the Potomac and the Eastern branch of the Potomac, now um, the, what we know as the Anacostia River. And yet up until recently, um, up until the last 10 years or so, we haven't really defined ourselves as a river city, right? Um, the, and, we really turned our backs to the river. Um, and um, the river is an amazing natural resource that for too long has been a hidden treasure. Um, the, and projects like the 11th Street Bridge Park, um, the, one of our key goals is re-engaging residents with the river itself. So um, with that, um, the, uh, where is the 11th Street Bridge Park? Um, the bridges uh, go across the Anacostia River, um, the connecting the neighborhoods of Capitol Hill and uh, Navy Yard. Um, so this is the um, Capitol Building, um, Nats Park, RFK Stadium, um, and connect the west of the river, um, the with the east of the river neighborhoods of Anacostia, Fairlawn. Um, the, this has been a point of crossing for about 300 plus years. Um, but at the same time, the river has been this dividing line um, for generations, um, dividing the neighborhoods by um, race, by health outcomes, by employment, um, the household values, sort of you name it. And I think one of the goals that most viscerally connects to our local residents is how do we create a new civic space that can both physically and metaphorically bridge different neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. that have been divided for so long. And in our case, we had uh, old bridges that were built in the 1960s um, the, that came to their end of the lifespan. Um, this is what the um, bridges used to look like um, and needed to be replaced. Um, and the then director of the Office of Planning, a woman by the name of Harriet Pergoning, had this idea, um, had this thought bubble of an idea of, of how do we use this unique point in time when the old bridges are coming down, new bridges are coming up, um, to save part of the old bridge and repurpose it um, the, to create uh, a new park, um, the, to create a new sort of stitched together opportunity. Um, when we first started working on this um, back in 2011, 2012, we tried to see if we could save the entire old structure. Um, both Harriet and I thought that the old deck, um, the, that sort of green span that you see right here had a beautiful industrial patina to it. Most people thought it was really ugly, um, but who is in the eye of the beholder? Um, but it turned out as we um, did a deeper dive into some of the engineering, um, it would have been cost prohibitive to save the deck. There's a reason why this bridge was being replaced. 
So the deck has been removed, but as we got deeper into the engineering um, and uh, saw that one of the most expensive, or I realized that one of the most expensive parts about building any river bridge um, the, isn't necessarily the deck, it's the piers, the pilings that hold all of the load, right? The piers and the pilings are in good shape. So um, as they were building the new bridges, they removed the deck and kept the old piers and pilings underneath that will be repurposed to hold our new park on the, um, and be replaced with a new deck that no longer holds vehicles and tractor trailers that will hold a series of community generated programming spaces. So you can see these are the three, um, two bridges, uh, the two old bridges were replaced with three new bridges. These are the two freeway bridges sort of right here, um, heading east to west. This is the new 11th Street local bridge, a 25 mile an hour traffic that um, that's, has a 16 foot wide pedestrian and bike path on the downriver span that we're gonna be connecting to. It's already done a good job of, of reconnecting the neighborhoods. And then the yellow outline um, the, that I'll do a deeper dive of in a minute um, the, um, will be the outline of the new park itself. So as we began this project, um, the, we set out four key goals. These have been the same key goals from the beginning. Um, one is improving public health. Um, the, the neighborhoods along the Anacostia River have some of the most challenging health statistics in the city and the country actually. 41.9% adult obesity rate highest rates of hypertension, um, the uh, type two diabetes, lowest access to fresh fruits and vegetables. There's one grocery store in Ward 8 serving over 75,000 residents. Compare that with over 11 full service grocery stores in Ward 6, um, the serving the same number of people. It's a huge health um, justice issue. Um, two is re-engaging residents with the river, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, the river is this uh, amazing um, the resource. Um, but we've been telling people, we've been telling residents for decades, don't go down to the river. And you know what? Um, people listened. Um, and in our case, um, we built as many barriers as we could between humans and the waterfront. We built not only one, but two freeways, uh, the 295 freeway and the 695 freeway, got the Navy Yard, a legacy of industrial pollution. Um, but people are finding their way back down to the river. Um, I kayak on the river on a pretty regular basis. Um, I've got a kayak at the uh, Anacostia Community Boathouse. Um, and when I'm out on the river, um, particularly as you go upstream past the CSX tracks um, towards Kingman Island, you know, you regularly see great blue herons, you see egrets. Um, I now regularly see bald eagles that have returned to the river. Um, I've seen what I thought was at first the largest rat that I've ever seen before in my life until I saw its tail and it was a beaver. There's a healthy beaver population that's coming back in the river. Um, and when you get people down to the river, you know, you, that's the way um, you build more champions, build the next generation of river stewards. Um, as I mentioned, the goal that um, the most connects with residents is that um, physically and metaphorically um, bridging different neighborhoods that have been long, long been divided, um, the by natural barriers and human barriers. And then finally, and I'll touch <clears throat> on this at the end of the presentation, um, the, but how do we make sure that this new park is an anchor, not just for economic development, but equitable and inclusive growth as we move forward. So as we began this project, um, before we engaged any architects, landscape architects, even any engineers, um, we went to the community and said, what do you think? Um, you know, we, we didn't want to bring some bright, shiny pictures to the um, local residents. Um, and I'm a resident nearby. I, I live in, um, by Barracks Road, just a few blocks away from the bridge. Um, we wanted to start um, really early um, the, of going out and in, in essence asking for permission if we should do this, right? Um, particularly east of the river, there's an enormous and justifiable amount of trust deficit um, the, because candidly people that probably look just like me have come to the community and, and made a whole bunch of promises and for a variety of reasons of promises haven't been fulfilled. And so we um, started meeting with um, several dozen um, the uh, local community leaders and saying, is this a good idea? Is it a bad idea? What do you think? And who else should we be speaking to? That quickly sort of ballooned into over 200 meetings um, the, those first two years. We've had over a thousand meetings to date with the community to drive sort of every element of the programming. 
And, and once we saw, and we even, I, I took a couple of weeks, and this was all as I was volunteering, um, working at the building museum, but I, I took a couple of weeks off from the building museum to work with um, young men and women who were participating as part of the summer youth employment program. And their task um, was to design what the park should look like. This was before we even engaged any um, architectural teams, before we led our design competition. Um, and these young men and women came up with these amazing designs, one of the, which you see in the bottom right-hand corner, um, that was really our inspiration um, the, for the design competition itself. Um, and, and then we started asking, well, all right, if this is something we sensed a, an enthusiasm from the community, we said, all right, well, then help us shape it. Help us make sure that every programming element that is on this park is coming from the community. So we heard a whole bunch of ideas, um, kept prioritizing I, those ideas, helped design charrettes on both sides of the river um, the, to uh, make sure we didn't miss anything. And these were the sort of key six or seven sort of key programming ideas um, the, that, that we kept hearing from the community. We baked these uh, programming concepts into a national design competition. And when we started working on the design competition, I'd never run a um, you know, large design competition like this before. Um, as I was doing research, I saw that many design competitions, the designers had no connection to the client, us more or less the community. And you know, that didn't really seem to make sense. So um, we uh, did something a little different. Um, we created something that we called our design oversight committee that was comprised of about three dozen local stakeholders, residents, faith leaders, government agencies. Um, and their job was to review the design brief before a single design team saw it. We made some pretty significant edits. Um, they met with our four final design teams during the design process, right? Um, the allowing them to raise red flags and refine the design, provide uh, an iterative feedback loop and at the end of an eight month process, um, the, this design oversight committee used the same criteria as our jury um, the, to select the design team. Um, I made a formal recommendation to the jury and it turned out they were unanimous for the design by OMA and Olin, and I'll walk you through it in a minute. Um, but I think the, um, I wouldn't have described this project sort of back then, but I, I, in this way, but I certainly would now that I think a lot of this project is how do we put decision-making authority back into the hands of the community? It's really critical. When we um, selected the design team, for instance, I didn't get to vote, local residents voted, right? Um, and that provides greater ownership on the, and, and a difference between community outreach and community engagement, right? Outreach tends to be unidirectional. Engagement is really a, a multi-directional um, uh, process. Um, so the design itself um, the, by Oman Olin is, is really elegant, um, the, um, simple and yet brilliant. It's two trusses that come together and meet sort of right in the middle, reusing the old piers and pilings. Um, and the, the design, that sort of X design, um, the inspiration was this moment of crossing on the river that in turn was inspired by the original um, Benjamin Banneker and Pierre Lampont plan for Washington DC where these giant avenues are crossing, right? Um, the, so it has this sort of historical element that, um, the, that it's pulling from. Um, and these, um, the crossing it's the, by creating that sort of double decker uh, design, it almost doubles the occupiable space of the park. <clears throat> so I'm gonna walk you from one side of the bridge to the other. These are some of our um, latest renderings, hot off the presses. Um, a entrance um, the, from the Navy Yard that will walk through a series of rain gardens. We're capturing all the, the water that's on the park um, the, um, because the, and we're over the river, the entire park should be a template for uh, and a model for um, environmental sustainability. Um, on the edge of each of the, um, the trusses, um, it gets you up high enough so you can see over the Navy Yard and you can see the Capitol Building, the Library of Congress, um, the Washington Monument, some really amazing views. Imagine sort of being here on the 4th of July, right? It's gonna be amazing. Um, as you're walking on the up to the center of the bridge, walks by a hammock grove, so a place not only for physical well-being. Um, the, but for mental health, there's an enormous toxic stress that are in our communities, even more so with the pandemic, right? So um, having a place that you can stop and, and, and take in these really stellar views of the river, 
we have a lot of places we can cross in rivers, but not a lot of places you can stop on the and really take in these um, majestic view sheds. And where you, where the bridge park is too, it, it sits right on a, a, a point of the river where the river curves, jogs about seventy degrees. So you've got these really amazing views um, down to Nat Stadium, the DC Water Building. You can see all the way to the Air Force Memorial to National Air to National Airport. As you reach the center of the bridge, this is the sort of um, quintessential moment of it where both sides of the bridge come together. Um, the our center plaza that we see as a place for folks to hang out, to meet each other, but also for events, like farmers markets, arts markets, um, impromptu concerts. Um, next to the uh, center plaza, there is a um, cafe and community meeting space. <clears throat> and this is one of our new spaces um, the, that the design team has added. We call it our community front porch. Um, the, it's adjacent to the cafe itself um, the, and, and next to um, the intergenerational play space. So this is covered but open to the elements um, and a place for um, people having a cup of coffee, um, the relaxing, meeting friends, but also uh, for smaller and for medium sized events. And then on top of the cafe is what we're calling our Great Lawn. This is a pretty large expanse that's sort of gently tapered at less than five degrees. Um, the that looking back towards the center plaza, so it makes a sort of natural amphitheater, but also as you get high up, it takes um, in these amazing views, not only on the, the west of the river, but also the east of the river, where you can see over to Cedar Hill, the historic home of Frederick Douglass. Um, look down over the Environmental Education Center and our performance space um, and looking towards the hills of Anacostia. This is one of my favorite new renderings. Walking down from towards east of the river um, towards Anacostia, uh, the, you walk through a 11,000 square foot play space. Um, we see this as an intergenerational play space and the current designs and we're just about to hire in a playground consultant as our next phase of refining the design. Um, that is to be inspired by the natural flora and fauna of the river itself, particularly the mussels um, the, that are making a comeback to the river, thanks to the work of uh, groups like the Anacostia Watershed Society and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, they've been um, reintroducing the brown-lipped mussel, which is a native mussel that filters something like 30 gallons of water a, um, a, a day. Um, they helps to significantly pull toxins as well as reoxygenate the river itself. Um, coming down off the bridge, um, the, you come to the Bridge Park offices. Um, the, on the top floor and the bottom floor will be our Environmental Education Center, which I'll come to in a second. Um, the Environmental Education Center um, the, will have enough space to bring in uh, 90 students, so three to four classes. Um, the Environmental Education Center will be run by the Anacostia Watershed Society um, that, is being, that has uh, been working to rehabilitate um, the, the river and to re-engage residents with the river for over 30 years. Um, we see this as a place to <clears throat> bring in school kids from DCPS, DC charter schools, the Maryland and Virginia school districts, um, and really inspire that next generation of, of river stewards during the week. And the nights and weekends have environmental classes, exhibitions and the like. Um, so this is a view from uh, the um, gangplank of the, um, the kayak and canoe launch um, just outside of the Environmental Education Center, also run by the Anacostia Watershed Society, will be uh, our kayak and canoe launch to get people out in the river um, and really experience um, the, the, um, the river itself, the mighty Anacostia. Um, and then um, as you come out of the Bridge Park offices um, the, um, and head down into Anacostia Park, um, you'll have it. This is one of our um, new sort of entrances and the uh, entrance plaza into Anacostia Park. And on top of a um, um, storage area, um, the, we have urban agriculture, um, the uh, gardens um, the, that we won't be growing necessarily a tremendous amount of food, but um, this will be a, a backdrop for gardening classes, for healthy cooking classes, for um, our CSA pickup and amazing views when you get up there at the new Frederick Douglass Bridge. And as you come into Anacostia Park, um, the, the, um, we have uh, um, actually originally in the original designs, the performance space was on the, the bridge itself, but um, A, it was getting a little smaller because of emergency service routes and sort of other things that we had to um, fit in there. 
And B, we started thinking about, well, how are we going to get a piano up on the bridge? Um, <laughs> the, there's no dressing rooms. So we've actually moved the performance space um, onto terra firma, onto land, and it's gotten significantly bigger. Um, this will now hold up to 250 seats. Um, the, you could max out at 400 seats um, with the river as a backdrop. Um, so we're calling this the river amphitheater. But most of the time, this will be a place for um, parents, for caregivers, for visitors um, the, to sit down, take in these great views of not only the bridge park and the river itself. Um, we are in the process right now of commissioning some significant public art for the park. Um, so we've pulled together a curatorial committee um, the, to identify um, a significant um, the piece of uh, long-term art, as well as several temporary three to five um, the year uh, installations throughout the park. Um, we'll have some more news to share on that um, in the coming months. Um, but we see the significant um, the piece of art, not only drawing from the history of the region and the community that is there, but also the uh, environmental um, the issues of sustainability. Um, and then views as you're heading towards Good Hope Road, um, the towards uh, Anacostia itself throughout the seasons in the fall. Um, and then the final rendering to show um, this is a view looking from Anacostia towards Capitol Hill. Um, the size of the park itself is about uh, when you add in both the approaches, the park on the end, the adjacent parcel of the um, the land on the east of the river is about seven acres, um, and the park itself is about the size of three football fields stacked end to end to end to give you a sense of size and scale. So we've been engaging the community from the beginning um, the, with this uh, project on the um, led our design competition and selected the design team in 2014. Um, we are currently uh, on our way to 65% design. Um, we will be going, we anticipate going in front of, um, for the second time, two very important federal design review agencies, the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts in November, uh, and the U.S., um, the National Capital Planning Commission in December. Um, and then being in 100% design by early next year and begin soliciting our general contractor. Um, the, with the idea of selecting the general contractor by the end of next year and then a couple months of mobilization and, um, you know, knock on wood, a uh, breaking ground end of next year. But as we've been thinking about the design of the park, we want to make sure that the park is deeply stitched into the adjacent neighborhoods. And this is something we've been spending a lot of time with um, the, over the last year. You know, how do we make sure that there's as many places as possible um, that, to, to get to the park um, the, through public transit? Um, there's a number of bus trunk lines that go across the 11th Street local bridge, the 90, the 92, the P6, the circulator recently rerouted itself on the, over the 11th Street bridge. We connect to the uh, Anacostia River Trail on the, that's on both sides of the river. Um, the, <clears throat> um, and then looking at all of the different opportunities for circulation, both from a pedestrian standpoint on the, and a uh, bike standpoint. Um, the, but also working um, in advance of actually breaking ground, how do we start sort of unpacking some of those barriers that we've made to the river itself? And over the last three, four years, we've made some significant investments in public art, trying to provide cookie crumbs to get people down to the river itself. Um, several years ago, we partnered with the Capital Riverfront bid um, the, and the, um, the historic, the U.S. Navy Museum, um, the um, on the um, west side of the river um, the, to go to cull their amazing photographic collections. And we've installed these giant historical images on their wall um, the, along 11th Street. Um, whoops, here we go, right down here, because this is a really challenging space coming down from um, the neighborhoods of Barracks Row and Capitol Hill. You're wedged between a freeway on-ramp and the security wall. So how do we both engage with the history um, the, of the region and at the same time soften um, the, some of that approach? Um, several years ago, um, we partnered with a East of the River artist, um, the um, Tendani, um, the, and uh, high school students from Eastern and Baloo High School to design and then create a series of large sculptural um, installations along the Anacostia River Trail in Anacostia Park. Um, we are just in the process right now of refurbishing all of those. So we just, um, re I just got an email this morning that we reinstalled the um, Navy Yard, um, the uh, installation. They're really striking, they're really beautiful. 
Um, there's four of them um, up and down the river trail. And then <clears throat> trying to undo the damage of the 295 freeway, the six lanes of concrete mess that have divided the communities east of the river to the park, um, to Anacostia Park, to the river and the future bridge park. We partnered with a, another east of the river organization, the Anacostia Art Center, um, the, to install all these about 90 feet of linear framed and lit art underneath the Good Hope Road to 295 underpass. Um, the, to again, try and sort of un, try and soften that approach of, of coming down to the river. Um, we didn't stop there. Um, the, we've had a robust series of programming to lure people down to the river. The biggest event that we do by far is the annual Anacostia River Festival. Um, the, we are now planning our eighth Anacostia River Festival, save the date for April 10th, um, the 2022. Um, this is an event that in pre-pandemic times would bring um, 10,000 people down to the banks of the river to experience for one afternoon what uh, will happen 365 days of the year on the, um, on the park itself. We partner with the National Park Service and it's the official closing program of the National Cherry Blossom Festival and over 40 nonprofits on the, to um, produce this um, giant event. Um, next year, we're planning on doing a series of giant concerts, um, the all socially distanced. It's really tough to be planning uh, six months ahead in a um, pandemic year, but um, our theory is a place that um, planning events where we can pivot between um, virtual and in-person and make sure that it's socially distanced um, the, um, by making little bubbles and um, on the, um, the giant field um, where we have this right in the corner of Good Hope and Anacostia Drive. Um, and then inspired by the real desire by local residents to put urban agriculture on the park that we've included in the design, um, we wanted to make sure that we were building the capacity now on the uh, working in collaboration with um, partners um, to develop a series of um, the uh, urban agriculture spaces, what we call our bridge park plots, in collaboration with communities of faith and nonprofits. So we now have uh, seven urban farms on the all in Southeast DC. Um, the little yellow sort of bubbles with white stars are the location of those um, urban farms. All of that food, much of that food gets aggregated into a weekly CSA um, called our CRISP CSA, Community Raised and Inspired and Shared Produce, um, that serves about 400 to 450 families a year um, at greatly reduced prices. Um, our fall session starts on September 25th. Um, the and enrollment is open now. It's the best deal in town. Um, we have bees at several of the sites um, at our Allen Chapel AME site and our National uh, Children's Center site. Um, and we'll be reintroducing bees at our farm here at the Ark um, the next year. And then our latest obsession has been um, <laughs> we've been growing mushrooms, um, shiitake and oyster mushrooms um, here at the Ark farm. Um, we've got a, about 120 logs that have been inoculated with um, mushroom spores. Um, actually, tomorrow we're going to be shocking our mushroom logs um, the, and harvesting uh, many pounds of shiitake mushrooms um, that will be distributed to the community. Um, our last program that I'll, I'll talk about on the, is at uh, the end of the season on the, we for the last five years now, um, we have a larger um, event on the, to celebrate the end of the season on the, we're now working on our fifth Taste of the Harvest Festival, which will be October 9th. Um, again, trying to do so in a safe way. Um, we're looking right now of having a drive-in sort of experience with bands and recipes and food and movies. Um, more information will be coming um, that you can find out at bridgepark.org. Um, and I want to um, end this sort of presentation in the last like 10, 15 minutes um, the, of sharing um, how this park itself has become so much more than just a park. Um, as we were out there talking to the community, asking for the programming ideas and suggestions for the design, you know, we heard all of these great programming ideas that we baked into the design competition, but we heard a much deeper need. We heard a need for jobs, for affordable housing, um, the, um, for preservation of Black-owned businesses east of the river. And so we started asking ourselves, what kind of role could we play to ensure that the thousands, tens of thousands of residents who shaped this project from the, be from the beginning can be the ones that benefit from it? So in 2014, um, we started working with our partners at LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation. They are a CDFI who've been serving 
the greater Washington DC area for over 30 years. Um, senior scholars from the Urban Institute, the DC Office of Planning, DC Fiscal Policy Institute, to do a deeper dive of who lives and works within a you know, one mile walk shed of the park itself, um, to really get a deeper understanding of, of housing prices, of, of demographic, um, the um, breakdown of um, the income. Um, and um, because if we're making recommend, with a larger goal of making recommendations um, the, that um, the local residents can not only stay in place, but thrive in place. And so once we had this data, we did what we've done from the beginning, which was go out and talk to the community. We spent a year um, the, in 2015 convening um, district officials, local stakeholders, faith leaders, fellow nonprofits to say, where are there strategies that we can put in place on the well in advance of the park itself <clears throat> to make sure we know who's benefiting from this park. And we really focused on four key areas that I'll walk you through, housing, workforce development, small business enterprises, and cultural equity strategies. Um, spent a year um, going, talking in large public forums, posting ideas online, refining these ideas, um, and all of that manifested itself in what we call our equitable development plan. Um, you can go to bridgepark.org slash equity and download um, the plan because I'm not going to go through all 34 different strategies, but I'm going to highlight just a few. Um, and our housing, um, the several of our housing strategies include uh, for the last five years, we've been partnering with a local affordable housing nonprofit called MANA, um, the Toronto Ward 8 Home Buyers Club that's seen over 600 participants. And, and we need to update this slide because over 90 Ward 8 renters have now become homeowners who've gone through the program. Um, and we're now starting to provide, um, we've been piloting down payment assistance um, as well as going through the home buyer curriculum itself. A key strategy uh, for the, in the housing um, bucket was to stand up a community land trust. So we partnered with City First Homes to um, start um, incubating um, the CLT east of the river that now has become the Douglas Community Land Trust. And I'm very thrilled to say that last year, at the end of last year, the Douglas Community Land Trust became its own separate 501c3. Um, its own separate nonprofit entity that has over 200 units of permanently affordable housing. <clears throat> if we're spending all this money to build the park, um, the how do we make sure that as much of those dollars go back into the local community as possible? But to do that, we need to make sure that local residents have the skill set and capacity to apply for and succeed at these jobs. So um, a couple months ago, we just graduated our 18th construction training program. Um, the over 70, um, the award six, seven and eight residents have already been placed in construction jobs. So, you know, when we put this job out to bid, if a general contractor comes back to us and says, well, I can't find any local residents to hire, we can say, well, here's a list of 150 people that currently have construction jobs that we've trained, you know, try again. Um, the, but it takes that sort of working intentionally and with the community and thinking about this work early to be effective. Very happy to um, share, um, and I don't think we really should share this publicly, but um, we uh, earlier this year received a large grant um, the, to not only continue funding the workforce development program um, at Skyland um, the, um, uh, for construction jobs, and then as we get closer to opening the park, um, the for jobs that will be on the park, everything from park administration to who's working in the environmental education center to um, the um, park maintenance staff, um, sort of you name it but also support um, the, a series of other similar transformed infrastructure into parks projects around the United States. So we've created a five city workforce, um, the pilot, um, the working with similar uh, transformed infrastructure into parks projects in Buffalo, Dallas, Grand Rapids, and San Francisco. Um, and all of this work um, the, is being studied um, the, and evaluated by a third party group, um, senior researchers at the Urban Institute, um, the, so that this can be a real template for how to invest um, in underinvested neighborhoods, um, the while ensuring local residents can stay and thrive in place. And then um, a real focus on small businesses, on black owned businesses east of the river, um, the, particularly with the focus of the commercial corridors of Good Hope Road and, and MLK, um, the, that has the Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue um, the, in Ward 8 has the largest collection of black owned, contiguous black owned businesses left in the city. Um, so uh, we've been partnering with uh, another fantastic CDFI, WACIF, Washington Area Community Investment Fund, 
um, to invest several million dollars in East of the River businesses through technical assistance and low-cost loans. And we're in the middle of a pilot right now with the Anacostia Business Improvement District to um, the provide new online, uh, support new online revenue streams for East of the River businesses that have really been hammered by the pandemic with a lack of um, foot traffic coming in. So we're working with three new businesses, three businesses on the East of the River to not only build their websites and build new online revenue streams, we've also connected them to an entire suite of small businesses, small business services provided at no charge uh, through a partnership that we have with Capital One. And finally, a series of cultural equity strategies. And what I mean by that is, you know, we can get the workforce right, the housing right, the small business right, but, but if, if East of the River and the communities that, that are around the um, park itself no longer feel like home, that is enormous downstream consequences. So um, the work of the cultural equity strategies are really amplifying the voices of, of local residents um, the, that are there. So doing everything from events like our Anacostia River Festival and Taste of the Harvest, but also supporting work that's already happening. So a great example of that is this Sunday, um, we are partnering with Don't Mute, D Don't Mute DC, and the GoGo Museum and Check It Enterprises for a big event on the, that's happening at the Skate Pavilion um, the, in Anacostia Park. It's gonna be awesome. So come on down to Anacostia Park. Um, the on September Sunday, September 19th from 3 to 7.30 um, for a huge skate event. There's gonna be go-go music. It's gonna be really amazing. Um, and then finally, um, I wanna to touch a little bit on um, the work that we've been doing uh, explicitly about the pandemic. Um, you know, when the pandemic happened a year and a half ago, I don't think anybody, certainly we didn't see how long this was gonna last, but We've done several different things. One, um, we have turned our main campus here at the Ark into a food distribution site. So every Wednesday, um, the, uh, in collaboration with the National Capital Area Food Bank, um, they, we've been handing out groceries. Um, we've handed out over 100,000 bags of groceries. Still doing this to this day, Wednesdays between 12 uh, and 2.30. Um, we transformed our theater, which was dark, of course, during the pandemic, um, the into a vaccination site in collaboration with Giant. So we vaccinated over 5,000 um, residents um, the, through uh, the vaccination site. Um, and then we uh, partnered with three other amazing place-based nonprofits located east of the river, uh, Martha's Table, Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative, and Bread for the City on what's become the largest privately funded unconditional crash transfer program in the country. We call this the Thrive East of the River program. It provides $5,500 in cash, um, the weekly groceries, monthly dry goods, and then connecting, I think we're up to over 560 Ward 8 families um, the, with navigators to um, sign up for unemployment, um, the workforce development training, what happened to my stimulus check, my child needs a laptop, so whatever um, that might be and distributed over two and a half million dollars today for residents that, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all afraid, and unfortunately this has come to pass, that East of the River was going to be hit particularly hard um, the, with the pandemic because these are residents who are keeping the city going, right? These are um, folks who can't necessarily, I mean, I'm painting with a broad brush, but can't, you know, you can't work from home if you're a bus driver, if you're working at the post office, if you're um, the helping, um, if you're working in a grocery store, um, and uh, the, the um, senior um, the scholars at the Urban Institute have been evaluating this from the beginning, and half of the families as, as part of our Thrive East of the River have an annual household income of $15,000 or below. Um, so that $5,500 that's completely unconditional um, and completely raised through private sources um, the, has been a real lifeline um, the, for these residents. So what does an unconditional cash transfer program have to do with building a bridge? Um, the sort of nothing and everything, right? Um, the, it's supporting the residents that are here um, the, um, to make sure um, that the uh, residents can continue to be supported. So a couple of ways that you can get engaged um, the, as part of the 11th Street Bridge Park. Um, one, you can attend our uh, next public meeting um, on Wednesday, October 6th. From 6.30 to 8, um, the, we're hosting a live virtual meeting with our design team, our engineering team, our director of equity, um, and our, partner, uh, our partners at the District Department of Transportation and the Anacostia Watershed Society. Um, we're soliciting feedback and sharing even more of some of our renderings. We really want, I really wanted to do this in person, but um, it didn't make sense. So um, this is going to be virtual um, and you can find out more information about that by going to bridgepark.org slash public meeting and registering um, the, and we'll send you a Zoom link. 
Um, and you can also sign up, go to bridgepark.org and sign up for our newsletter, keep in touch with all of our programs. Um, you can volunteer um, at one of our farms every Wednesday. Um, we have volunteer opportunities at the farm. Um, you can also make a, you um, are so inclined to make a tax deductible contribution at bridgepark.org um, to support all of this investment, not only in the park, um, but in the residents and the neighborhoods and the communities nearby. So for more information, you can go to bridgepark.org um, um, and do a deeper dive in um, much of this information. And with that, I am going to pause and stop sharing um, and see what kind of questions I can answer. And take a big drink of water. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, Scott, that was absolutely amazing. This sounds like such a fascinating project and it's amazing to see just how in how engaged it is with the community. And um, I hope, you know, some of our members here who are attending today also attend those events and get involved whenever they can, because uh, it sounds really wonderful. Um, so I will take a look and see what questions we have. So Carl asks, um, oh, and just to, rem just to tell everybody, you can put your questions in at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. Uh, you can also raise your hand and that should also be at the bottom of your screen and we will unmute you if you're comfortable with that. Um, just so you know, so. So Carl asks, uh, they're deconstructing the old South Capitol Street Bridge. Can you recycle some of the steel from that bridge for your park? That is a great question and not being an engineer, I can't, I, uh, I can't answer that. I, my, my sense is probably not because that bridge has been up for a long time um, the, and the weather is, uh, it has been weathered um, the, in a marine environment, um, but certainly something we can ask um, our colleagues at DDOT. And, and I gotta say, it's just, been so fantastic to see the Frederick Douglass Bridge open. Um, I ran across it for the first time Wednesday morning. Um, they, it's so beautiful. And just think in a few short years, we're gonna be bookended by the Frederick Douglass Bridge in Levin Street Bridge Park. Um, the, so we're really gonna be a city of bridges. Yeah, it's gonna be really wonderful. And just those arches, oh my gosh, I love it. It's, it's great. Um, so let me see here, cause I think we have a couple of different questions from different folks that are asking kind of the same thing. So let me see here real quick. Okay, yeah, so we have a couple of questions here about like where exactly the funding is coming from yeah. for this. And I think also earlier this week, we had a question on Instagram about um, how has like the pandemic like impacted your funding? Because I think something came out kind of early about potentially losing some of that funding, but I'll leave that to you to answer. Yeah, most of the way these, um, I'll give a preamble and I'll answer the question directly. Um, most of the way these transformed infrastructure into parks projects, um, they have, have worked, all of them really, um, the, has been a blend of a public private funding. Um, the, so, um, the, and roughly about half of the uh, construction funds, sometimes a lot more, um, they comes from city, state, um, the um, federal sources. Um, so we describe this as a larger $139 million capital campaign, and that includes $75, uh, $80 million for the construction of the bridge. Um, the, we're going to be running the bridge too, building bridges across the river is going to be running the park. The district owns the asset, but then we're going to have a 99 year lease for the city to run it, and we'll be responsible for all of the costs of maintaining it. Um, mm -hmm. the, but $75, $80 million to um, build the park. Um, a $10 million capital reserve to run the park. Um, and then we built in $55 million um, for our, all of our equitable development strategies of which we've blown past that $55 million goal. We're actually closer to 67, $70 million. Out of that $139 million goal, um, we're at 118 million. Um, the, so we've got about 21 million left to go. Um, that includes um, the 35, 38.5, um, 38.3, I think I got that right, um, the uh, million um, the, from the district, um, mm -hmm. the, um, and then we are raising the balance of the funds. Um, we're raising the money from private sources, um, from individuals, from families, from um, corporations, from foundations. Um, very pleased that Congressman Norton has supported a community funded project, um, the um, AKA as earmark. Um, for $3 million that will go to the construction um, that passed the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Committee and the full House Appropriation Committee. So we're cautiously optimistic that that will come in too. Um, and if anybody, <laughs> if anybody um, has uh, some dollars that want to support, um, the please let us know. Um, I will, um, the, um, the, that made me think of one other thing. Um, the, and it's um, just left me. So, um, so we have, um, the, uh, an additional $21 million to go or 85, 86% there. Oh, I know what it's gonna be. Um, how has the pandemic sort of related um, or impacted us? 
Um, you know, during the pandemic, we really took a pause in our capital campaign and really put all of our effort towards this Thrive East of the River, uh, an explicit COVID relief fund, because that was the right thing to do. Um, and, but we're now, uh, and we've raised over $4.1 million to support the Thrive East of the River program. Um, but over the last several months, we've really started cranking back up our capital campaign um, effort. And we hope, um, knock on wood, to have some um, really good announcements coming up soon. And we're really happy to see um, the full funding um, the, um, the, the council passed last year um, the, uh, was included in Mayor Bowser's budget, um, the mm -hmm. submitted to council um, the, that was recently passed last month. So, um, which is good. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to see how many people are supporting this, um, all the funders. So, uh, well, I'm going to wait and see if we have any questions from Facebook, give folks some time to think of anything. We do have like a comment from Mark in the chat. He just said, uh, this is one of the nation's most visionary and ambitious urban park projects. Bridging cultures and neighborhoods is huge. So yeah, absolutely. Mark. Thank you, Mark. I'll say too, as you're looking up, I think one of the things, and this was never the intended goal, but um, you know, we've um, to date we've been able to you know invest over seventy million dollars into the park. Um, the and uh, and you know we're several years away from opening. By the time the park opens, we'll be investing in our equitable development strategies for seven eight years, right? Um, and this work has now become a real inspiration for um, many other projects. We're now advising almost a dozen similar projects around the country, all pro bono, right? But um, the um, but to um, work with our own residents on the to create a series of equitable development strategies. We're working with cities in Los Angeles and uh, um, Boston and um, Durham and Minneapolis, um, and it's it's really exciting. To see the nation's capital be a real template on the for you know how, how we invest in um, the uh, neighborhoods um, the, mm -hmm. to make sure that local residents can benefit. Wow, that's amazing! Well, that's really great. Um, yeah, I'm just waiting to see if we have any other questions from folks. Um, I will say I put all of the uh, there's links in the chat to the main website to the Highland uh, Highline Network. We have the equitable development plan in there as well, community investments to date, everything that uh, Scott has talked about, including the registration page for the public meeting happening on, on October 6th that Scott mentioned and their social media yeah. handle. And as well as uh, there's an article here too that we wanted to share, it was from Next City called uh, Can a Park Prevent Gentrification? I don't know if you wanna talk about that at all, Scott, before folks read it or anything. Yeah, the, that was, we're really pleased with that article. It was one of the better articles that really captured our, um, how um, we've worked from the beginning of, of having local residents really shape this project um, the, um, and a deeper dive of the equitable development work as well. Um, so that came out earlier this year and, and um, really started doing a deeper dive in, in all of our equitable development strategies and lessons learned. And, and from the beginning, um, the we've had, and I should have included these links, but um, the, Scholars from the Urban Institute have been um, the, the, um, providing a real-time feedback loop for all of our equitable development strategies for the last five years. And they recently, over the summer, created a series of um, white papers on, the, on lessons learned, as we've learned from our colleagues around the country, how do we push others further up the learning curve. Yeah. Um, and um, we've been doing a series of um, virtual public events on the uh, themed around some of those um, topics. And the next program will be on some of our cultural equity strategies that will be run by our uh, program coordinator, Destiny Johnson, at noon on September 29th. And you can register for that free event um, the, at bridgepark.org. Just click the events button on the, and um, see the amazing panel that Destiny's put together. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and again, yeah, everybody, the website's in the, in the chat for that, but also like, I'll send a follow-up email to everybody. So Scott, if there is anything additionally you want me to share with them in, in addition to this, like, I'll make sure to do that. Um, cause there's like a lot of great stuff to read here, folks. So I encourage you to do so. And I um, encourage everyone, feel free to reach out directly. I can be reached at scott at bridgepark.org on the, either myself or, or one of the team members and we'll be happy to, um, the get back to you. So um, we invite you and we're trying again, like it's hard to plan <laughs> the pandemic, but we're trying to um, re-kick off our walking tours. We think we can do that safely um, oh, cool. the, in October. Um, so I don't know the date off the top of my head, but you can find out more information on the on our website or sign up for our newsletter on the to um, get all those announcements. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Um, also, just as a side note, I was glad that you talked about the Anacostia Watershed Society because we just had a boat tour with them. So it was nice oh, to yeah. hear them and all this. So it was great. 
Um, and amazing partners. They've been designing all of the space from the beginning. Um, they had to make sure it worked for them with a wet lab and dry lab and exhibition space. And um, they've been amazing partners from the beginning. Yeah, and it's so exciting to hear that they're going to have that space to kind of run their education stuff. And and they were talking to us about the muscles too, and it was so fascinating. So it's it's great to hear. I've been um, obsessed by mushrooms <laughs> and by muscles. So, um, yeah. They, yeah, yeah, it's been really amazing. It's they, these they, little um, they they put um, a big a big series of baskets several years ago under the 11th Street Bridge, and um, the little um, oh, I forget what they're called, fry. I think what they're called. maybe that's fish. Anyways, um, the um, the and they've been thriving. Um, the and uh, they've also been uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Anacostia Watershed Society have been putting them on all the tributaries coming into the Anacostia River, and and okay. um, and it, and it's a, like as someone who's been kayaking on the river for the last ten years. The subaquatic vegetation um, the, that's coming back has just been phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. the, and really kudos to uh, the district um, the Department of Energy and Environment under Tommy Wells and, and Bowser administration for um, and DC Water for significantly cleaning the river. Um, Anacostia Watershed Society has plans to have the Anacostia River be swimmable and fishable by the year 2025. That's right around the corner. Yeah. So imagine tire swings in the Anacostia, right? It's going to be um, really amazing. And it, but that's been decades of uh, groups like Anacostia Watershed Society, river keepers, um, the, um, yeah. the living classrooms to um, uh, get us there across the finish line. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, just as like another side note, like when, I, when we went, like a lot of our members had never kind of really been to like the Anacostia Park. I don't know how many really visited the Anacostia River, you know. Um, this is like the first time a lot of them to even be on the boat tour, but I encourage folks like take that boat tour, it's free. Um, it is funded by like the district. So, but yeah, it's, I think a good thing to kind of do. But um, anyway, I don't see any other questions from anybody. Scott, I don't know if you have any last words that you want to say before we close out here at all. Um. Just a huge thank you again to DCPL for this opportunity um, to build some more champions for the project, hopefully provide a, a little bit more. I mean, what started as sort of this kernel of an idea is, is turned into um, something much bigger, but um, the intentionally so. Um, and we encourage you to get engaged, get involved, volunteer, ask us questions, make a donation. Um, the um, and because by working together, um, the, we can leverage um, all of our sort of individual, individual assets for a much larger impact um, the, and work to bridge DC. So thanks everybody, really appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you so much, Scott. This is really wonderful. And again, I wanna echo what he just said, get involved, you know, donate if you can, but this is a really wonderful project. And we, I, I'm sure we all look forward to seeing you know, where it goes from here um, and to see it complete. So it's gonna be great. Um, so I guess like before we officially end things here, um, I just want to remind everybody again, like take a look at those links. I'll send a follow up email with all these resources and just to be on the lookout for what we have planned next as part of like of our 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, this evening, we're hosting a community meeting. Thanks, <laughs> a community meeting to review a draft of the historic context study of women's history and suffrage in Washington, DC. So that's free, that's open to the public. And on Saturday, we're having a crab feast at the Washington Canoe Club along the Potomac. So that's gonna be a pretty nice weekend um so you can learn more about these programs and more on our website and with that i just want to wish everybody a nice rest of their day thank you again to scott this was really wonderful and fascinating to hear about um and we look forward to seeing you all at future events so have a wonderful day thanks melissa bye everybody thanks